Okay, in the last lecture, we talk about the FEM. for the Chancian diffusion problem. Okay, and we will continue that the discussions. What is the necessary ingredient for writing a finite element model is that first, I need to have a boundary value problem or more accurately, if it's Chancian diffusion problem, uh, initial boundary value problem. Okay, so this gives us the formulation of the strong form. Okay, and from the strong form, I would actually introduce a uh, chi functions. I'm looking for uh, uh, projections that give us the uh, width form of the residual, which doesn't mean that the strong form is fulfilled everywhere but in uh, integrations in a subdomain, uh, a weaker statement is actually fulfilled. Okay, so, and then from that, we have the collection form, which we include, uh, in, introduce the more restrictions on the child space to make it finite dimensional. Okay, so for example, if I can use sine and cosine, I can also form a width form only using sine and cosine functions, but that would not be, you, you would not able to solve a problem with a matrix system unless you cut the number of terms that you want to include in the sine and cosine uh, for the transform. Does that make sense? Because otherwise you can go infinite, then you have a matrix with infinite component. And from that, we assemble the matrix and they give us a matrix form. Okay, so this is what the last lecture is about. So uh, let me quickly write down the strong form. Okay, so I write S and then I will first define, in fact, I would say that when you're solving the problem, it is always a good idea to, to actually specify what is, what is given to you and what is the procedure if you're trying to find something. Given S, S, which is actually a specific uh, storage of the material, then map a domain uh, position vector into a positive values. It's a positive value because specific storage is supposed to be positive. And then given the source term, then map the boundary conditions that prescribing the source term to a real number. Okay, this could be positive or negative. And also the prescribed essential boundary conditions map it also to a real number because the potential can be positive and negative. Find the find the potential such that in the domain that are excluding the boundary, we can map or or any po any point in this any position vector in this domain uh, onto onto a real number. Okay, so that real number is a field. So um, when you think about the terminology field, what do you think? What, what, do, you, what do you see? Okay, imagine there's a corn field, okay, or a rice field or whatever. So what do you see? If there's a wind blowing the field, okay, there's uh, some arrow that, uh, okay, okay, or the pen are actually moving, right? Okay, that's what I'm talking about. Is actually so the vector, the difference between the vector and the vector field is that the vector field is actually uh, a collection of vector that take uh, positions and then give you a vector values. At the different positions, you may have a different vector. Okay, does that make sense? So I want to specify this because sometimes even that causes confusion. Okay, so now with that, then uh, we have all the. Uh, stuff that are setting up and then we are actually looking for the statement okay so this is given to you and then this is what we find and then what we actually want to find is that this x is subject to further constraint that we want to be true and one is this governing equations and then this has to be written if we remember, this is actually the Darcy's velocity. This has to be written as a function of h and h only. Okay, if it is not, you have two unknown. 
which is actually also possible, but you have a mixed formulation, which we would actually talk about it later. Okay, so in the prescribed boundary values, we have the expect prescribed value, and then in the part where we're supposed to have the natural boundary described, the Darcy velocity times the normal vector is actually equal to uh, tower S, and then and then the last one is actually prescribed interestingly in the space time continuum. Okay, so there are different ways to write it. One is that you write it as a T. Okay, sometimes people also like to write it like this. Or zero all the way to uh, infinite or whatever. Or actually a prescribed time for terminations. So, etc, etc. Okay, uh, so this gives you the strong form. And... Uh, and then we, and then there would be a weak form corresponding to that. So what we, in the strong form, if you work out these details, you will get a divergence of V, okay? And then the important thing is that this Darcy's law is actually coming from the, coming from the gradient of the potentials, okay? Times the conductivity. Okay, so I have a divergence of minus k times gradient of h. Okay, so what this means is that in order to calculate that, I need h to actually have a Laplacian that are finite, right? Okay, does that mean does the do you know, do you understand what I'm talking about? I need to I I'm assuming that the h can take two derivatives and not boring up. Okay. Otherwise, I would also get something infinite, and infinite cannot can never be equal to zero. Does that make sense? Because the strong form is to enforce something equal to zero, right? Okay, so I expect this term and this term will counterbalance each other. Okay, uh, so how do I do that? Then actually, I have to assuming that H have the level of smoothness that are actually uh, in H2, which means that the... Um, the x itself has to be able to take the width with twice. Uh, the width form, we actually write down the equations. So basically, I need to introduce the, the child functions and then the rating functions. Okay, the rating function is actually the one you want to uh, the solutions to be orthogonal to. And then the child function is actually the one you use to use to interpolate a solutions. So the extra, the assumptions that we made is the following: I can somehow write uh, my system of equations as the child functions, and then I can actually uh, write my rating function into some kind of space. Okay, so we call it. We can even call it the space because it's actually. Uh, uh, some kind of Hilbert space uh, that we use. Okay, so um, I don't want to write down the read form because I think you cover in your final element course. Okay, but I do want to talk about the property that are lead to the Galician form. Okay, so um, there are property that we want, and one of them is actually related to the continuity. Okay, so does everyone know what is a continuity? Okay, so this is continue. This is also continue. This is not continue, okay? Okay, what is the difference between the two is that I can actually have one point start here and I can travel without uh, mapping out of the curve. I'm always on this curve when I'm moving from one point to the other versus as here, there is something called jump. Okay, what is the jump? Is actually the same position vector give you two different values. Okay, so things that are not smooth are actually can be described as a jump. Okay, what, what uh, physical phenomena are best described as a jump? Fracture is perfect. Okay, initially you have a body, 
and then the body can be deformed with a displacement field. So displacement is written as a function of x, y, z, for example. Okay, but when there's a crack, okay, in this point, okay, let's say you deform it like this, okay, in this line, okay, it's actually pretty convenient to map the uh the the material into a jump. Okay, using a jump, so meaning that if I have a this, let's say I'm just for convenience, let's say this point is actually uh, at the origins, okay? At this point, uh, I would actually have two displacement instead of one displacement, does that make sense? Okay, so uh, if I actually set the north reference point here, I will have one point going up, one point going down. Now the price you pay is that if you if you actually have one pawn converge into two pawn, okay, you still can actually create those mapping, but then the inverse doesn't exist. Does that make sense? Okay, so if you create a, if you try to create a mapping, uh, you will find that you can construct those mapping forward, but you cannot construct anything for a backward. So this is actually uh, uh, equations that can map back and forward. It's called one to one functions. Okay, and this is not a one-to-one -one function. Okay, so in general, uh, what we actually typically want is that we want both of the H, uh, Hilbert space, sorry, we want both the tri space and then the rating function space to be in H1. Okay, what is H1 functions is that it has some sort of continuity. Okay, exactly what is the continuity is that? We want it to be continuous, but what X1 means is that we also want the derivative to be continued. Does that make sense? Okay, so uh, can you give me some example where the where um the derivative is continued? Okay, one example is sine. Okay, if I write sine x, I can take a derivative, I get cosine, I take another derivative, I get sine, cosine, sine, cosine. So this function is called C infinite. Okay, meaning that you can take as many derivatives as you want. But in general, uh, we actually, in a final element, we don't usually need this uh, for some special case we may need it. Um, in general, what we actually want is the H1 function, which just require that the derivative of it is actually, um, uh, is actually continuous, but not necessarily the second derivative. Okay, so can you give me an example where you can take one derivative but not two derivative? You can work on it back, uh, you can work it back to actually guess what those functions look like. If you take a derivative and it's continuous, that means that the derivative would exactly look it would at least look something like this, right? Okay, so in this case, the derivative is actually, uh, if I actually write a field, say f, if I say that parcel f, parcel x is actually look like this, what does the integration look like? Okay, so this is actually in 1D, just refer to the slope, right? So at this point, what, what would happen? Okay, so a straight line meaning that, what, what does that mean? If the derivative is actually a flat line, what does that mean? So, so, so what does that mean? The slope is actually, the slope is not changing, okay? Convert it verbally so that you can have something like this, something like this, but it will be a straight line, right? Okay, so what, what is this point? It means that the derivative is actually changing, right? Okay, so that means the slope is changing. So what does the slope changing mean? Yeah, yeah so it become either more, uh, so it because it mean just mean the slope is changing over time, right? Okay, so you, you kind of get, get a curve that's something like this. It allow you to change the rate of the train. And then if this is actually a straight line, you can still gradually changing something, not necessarily uh, if it's not flat, but let's say something like this, you can change a little bit, okay. 
anyway so uh, what uh, so what you would actually need is actually you need uh, this kind of continuity and why is that I think procedure why we all know okay so let me write down the equations um, the width form equations is actually look something like this Okay, so there are two volume integration term and one uh, boundary term that are actually described here. Okay, so why do we need some kind of continuity? Okay, so imagine that the opposite, if we don't have continuity, so what will happen? Okay, so imagine that your field look like this. Okay, this is your edge okay now what happened to this term what happened to the if you take the first derivative okay you will have a peak that are going to infinite right because the derivative is actually infinite you see one because there's a jump there then can you integrate anything with a peak that are infinite okay you, you simply cannot okay so this is actually mainly on the term that required derivative another thing to notice is the following now notice this width form, okay. Now this I actually uh make the requirement a little bit uh, more general. I only need the function to be able to take one derivative. Okay, I I don't actually need it to be uh, and also another important thing that because you all learn Feynman, I don't, I want to skip the detail, but talking about well, what actually happened there, when you integrating this term, how do you integrate this? in that entire domain you are actually not calculating this term directly but you integrate it per element right n element and then i would actually have this term per element okay so and then maybe i element or maybe i use j okay i just integrate it over element right so in between the element uh, I actually don't require any continuity at all. I just need it to be able to assemble my integration one by one, and then together I will get my system of equations. Okay, so there's this trick there that why we want to use the width form. One of the uh, important uh, uh, property that we gain uh, by using the width form is that we don't necessarily need the same level of continuity. So now we go to the Galician, so, so far so good. Okay, now we go to the Galician form. Okay, the Galician form is more restricted, but at the same time, you also need to make even more choice. Okay, so there are two different kind of, uh, generally speaking, there are two different kind of uh, Galician form, the standard Galician form. And then the the fractal Galician form. Okay, so what is the difference between the two? Does anyone know? Yeah, exactly. Okay, if I use the same, uh, if I use the same finite dimensional space for my weighting function and try functions, I get the standard form. If I actually want to use a different set of equations, for example, uh, linear functions for my trial functions and uh, polynomial of a second order for my um, for my uh, weighting functions and still linear for my trial functions I will get a perturbation form okay so now in general um, the benefit of using the standard Galician form is that it's easier to assemble because you don't have the different different structure uh, and also it lead to a symmetric matrix when you actually get the matrix form, okay? This is for very trivial reason. You basically are, are calculating the inner product and if the same functions are, if they are actually spanned by, if the child, 
and basis functions are spent by the same uh, basis, you would actually get a uh, inner product that uh, actually have the symmetry allow you to swap the uh, left and right order. Now the picture collection form is actually non-symmetric. So if you're solving a problem in a symmetric solver, you will find that it's much faster. But why is the picture collection form exists? Is that it gives you more flexibility to handle instability. Okay, that we will actually not cover right now in this lecture, but talk about it later. So a lot of the problem that actually handle uh, instability issue are using simply using the petroglycan form to fill, uh, using it as a filter for the oscillation mode. Okay, so there are other ways to doing it, but this would be an example. If you solve the Richmondson equation, you would you probably heard of the petroglycan form. There are also other collection form like discontinuous collection form. So what what the uh, discrete collection form mean is the following: in the standard file element, the file element share the edge like this. Okay, and then you integrate it, and that's it. Okay, and in the petroglycan form, the same. Okay even though they don't spend by the same function. The discontinuous glycan form actually is very interesting. They sh don't share the edge. Okay, so for the same shape, we are solving this. Okay, so what is the difference between that is that in here, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven degree of freedom. Does that make sense? Here, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. 14, 15, 16, 7, 18 degree of freedom. Okay? For the same resolutions. Okay. Does it look like a good idea? Okay. It's more expensive, but why do you want to do that? This actually exists. Okay. Why do you want to do that? Can you guess? So this has been used a lot in dynamic problem or in shock problem. Okay, what well, well, what is the advantage of that is that you see those edge, they don't share the element. Okay. So if you define the same space, okay, in a subdomain, what is the advantage of the descriptive uh Galician method is that if you 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 expect your solution to have a lot of jump, okay, a shock wave or dynamic problem where you propagate a very uh very uh um sharp gradient pattern moving left and forward or even the jump then this uh this script glycan uh um formulation can give you an edge on solving those problems another application is solve incompatible elasticity problem uh but notice that uh, in general this is much harder to use and it's actually more expensive in the sense that you also need to ensure the stability Okay, so their internal penalty method or other way to ensure that the the um the discrete continue uh discontinue element doesn't get overlap with each other, um but in general this is actually not uh not an easy thing to do. Uh, if you like, you can also try to <laughs> using this as your final project. Um. Okay, so but also it, this also have another advantage. The discrete uh discontinuous glycan is that um the work from uh MIT but uh, uh actually they are uh interesting work on using this to model factor. So the idea is that you're simply using the edge, the discontinued part to capture the factor. Of course you have mesh dependency, but um but this is actually certainly possible. Now, but the, the, the job of the collection form is to pick a space that gives you the advantage of solving a problem, okay? And you can pick many, any space in your undergraduate class or in your master class, what is the space you put, you typically use? What is the name of it? It's just polynomial, okay? So polynomial, this is a, polynomial is a beautiful, elegant, Basis that can do a lot of things. Okay, what is polynomial is simply is I think everybody learn it right. One a x plus b x square. 
plus c x squared from the okay this is 1d so what happened in 2d okay i just keep writing those uh, bases with both x and y and then a couple of times without missing anything okay uh, so and then uh, we can talk about the matrix form um, so the important thing about the matrix form is the following i would actually now formally introduce a basic functions here and then i would say that my h my potential functions is actually a function of the space and x here is not just the x coordinate but a position vector that are actually n w x times h a plus okay um so sorry not w let me improve my writing a little bit this should be that should be h okay so n h a refer to the refer to the shape of basis functions for nook a okay so you have a final element you have a lot of nooks so for the a nooks you have a n functions so what does that mean what is the property of the check function you want to have is that uh, one of the important one is that it has to have the connected delta property which means that in the final element mesh at at the point where you have the final element so i have a let's say i did not describe the whole thing let's say i just simply pick a point here i did not probably successfully mention this anyway so at this point okay let's put it as example i would actually have a x coordinate right okay does that make sense okay so i will have an x vector that are pointing to this right so if i actually substitute my check functions at x a which is actually what is this point i would get back what values what value which should i get yeah at this point so so each so the number of the basis function is actually equal to the number of unknown i have okay uh, for the diffusion problem, one uh, nooks have one unknown. Okay, so um, for the for every nooks, uh, if I actually put the position vector of that nooks into the corresponding check function, I should get one. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, and everywhere else, what should I get if I put it to every every zero? So when I say everywhere else, I mean every other nooks. Okay, so if I I think in the textbook you will see that one check for the given nooks and then for all the other nooks you get zero okay this is why you get this funny check and then it's zero okay and why do we need that so i'm i told you <laughs> this is what it's supposed to be but i'm interested to know whether you know why it need to be okay why do you need it to have one why, why can it be 0.75 or point or 1.01 or 1.05 why okay let's imagine that you don't have that property okay you don't have the connected data property so what will happen what will happen to the nodal solution and the exact solution at the nodes they will be different right you see what i mean okay so this would actually cause more problem because of what if they're different so how do i prescribe the essential boundary conditions okay if i want to say at this point uh x is supposed to equal to five at this point x equal to four so what should i do okay i probably can still try to find the corresponding uh values if the shake function doesn't have the uh, clinical delta 
uh, doesn't have the this property, but I will have much harder time to do it, right? Right now, I already know that at this point, the shake, the nodal values and the shake function value at this point is identical. So if by prescribing the nodal value, I indirectly prescribing the prescribed value of my solution field directly, okay? So that makes things easier. Okay, so this is a desirable property to make things easier. Now, is there any method that doesn't fulfill that rule? Is there a method that doesn't fulfill that rule? For example, SPH, uh, smooth, and high, uh, uh, smooth, smooth and particle hydrodynamic doesn't fulfill that rule. Uh, the original form of meshless a method doesn't fulfill that rule, so you actually have to find other way to introduce the boundary conditions, which make it much harder. Okay, now another question is that why do I write it in two terms instead of a one? So they are identical, but we simply want to split it on the thing that uh, we already described in the boundary. Okay. Now finally, so um, with that, then what we actually would have is do I need to substitute these expressions into the Glickin form of governing equations and then what would I get? Do you know what we will we get? Let me work out the substitute this expressions and on the other hand i would also substitute uh the the weighting function as something like this assuming that i'm using the i'm using the uh standard Galician equations now c is simply your coefficients okay it could be anything because you don't actually restrict the values of your trial function your, of your weighting function you want it to actually give you zero for whatever uh, element in that space, you always get the zero equations. Okay, so in the matrix form, I would have the specific storage term plus the gradient term. equal to the change in the boundary. Okay, so far so good. This is actually the weak form. Now I actually... Okay, so what would happen is that through the substitutions, I would actually get this term. Okay, so this term become this. Can you see this? It's simply the inner product. Okay. Okay, so strictly speaking, I should take the C here also. Also, okay, you understand what I'm saying? I will take a C, A, H here. Do you know why? So this is a scale. This term is a scalar, right? Okay, so what does this term give you? It gives you a vector, right? Okay, do you see that? So this this thing is a matrix. A and B are three index, okay? So it gives you a matrix. I have two index, so I need a matrix to contain it. If I only have one index, I will have a vector, right? Okay, so, um, sorry, this has to be B in this case, okay? So that CT is here. Now what happened with the second term? The second term could be uh, simply this. I will introduce for convenience a new terminology. Um,
Okay, so what is Yi? Yi is simply the... I am just want to introduce more terminology to confuse you, I guess. It's simply the gradient of N. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, do you, do you see how? This is also the gradient of N. Okay, so far so good. So I add these two terms together, and then what I would have is actually the boundary term, which I will simply uh, write it in the same manner, C A T gradient um, N T A S. Okay, so now uh, I want you to pay attention to this. What happened to um to this um to this fiat? So this one, this one, this one. What happened to this two term compared to the width form? I take it out from the integrations, right? Did you see that? Why why do I take it out? Well, they're constant, right? Okay, okay, they're coefficient. They don't change with time. So why do I put it there? I can take it out, right? Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so this is the nodal change of time, uh, nodal rate of change of the potential. This is nodal values of the of the potentials for different nodes, and these three things are arbitrary, so we can just take it out. Okay. Just forget about it. Okay. Initially, I have an inner product, which is a scalar. In a, I, I cannot have a scalar to find the system of equation. I would if if this is the case, I only have one equation, right? Doesn't it? Does it? Isn't it? Okay. So I take out the CT. Okay. So then I will have a vector system of equation. Does that make sense? Okay. So just think about it. Okay. In a really grand scheme of thing, uh, let's say I have a, t, um, k. B equals to um, A T B. Okay, so maybe did I write correctly, or maybe something like this X. Okay. Okay. So uh, yeah. Okay. So I have the I have an equation of this format. Okay. Okay. So I can take it out. Okay. And uh, notice that what is the next? What what do I what kind of matrix do I have? Is that I will have a uh, matrix here coming from this term, and this two term, okay, the inner product of this term, and then I also have the another matrix that I will call omega, and then I will call this external term. Okay, if I actually write it. Out in a matrix form, I have a m matrix times the rate of change of h times the uh, kind of like a stiffness matrix, uh, a conductivity matrix times h and then times g ext, which is the external term. Okay, so these two matrix has a formal, man formal name, and one is called the capacity matrix. Another one is called the conductivity matrix. Okay, and this is just external term. Okay, so far so good. Okay. If you use Phoenix, you don't even assemble this, you only go to the width form, so this is good or bad because I think as a finite element person, you need to know how to uh, definitely think that you need to know how to assemble a matrix form yourself 
Uh, but for convenience, um, this would take time. Anything that takes time become harder to do, I guess. Mm -hmm. So this is the matrix form, okay? But what, uh, can you solve this problem now? Uh, why? I have two unknown, right? One is x dot, one is x. So what should I do? I want to solve it as a system of equations, okay? What is a system of equations? Is some kind of a x equals to b, right? Okay, not not uh, a x dot plus b x plus equal to c, okay? So how do I do that? Okay. So the classical way, there are multiple ways to doing it. Like in this world, I guess the problem is that you can finish things in a multiple different way. The classical way is to perform a finite difference in time, okay? And a finite element in space, okay? So you mix the technique of finite difference and the finite elements in order to solve this problem. Another way is to match both the space time to get to actually get a space time finite element, which is also another technique that could be used. Okay. So let me ask you a question before we move further. Um, have you done anything in finite difference before? Okay. So what is the difference in terms of the um, conceptual idea between finite element and finite volume? Uh, sorry, finite element and uh, finite difference? We talk about the final element so far, right? What is the conceptual difference? So, okay, so in final element, what we're actually trying to do is that we assuming the solutions uh, assume certain properties such as continuity. We assume that it's in a space and we actually use the exact operator, but we actually calculate the residual in a width or Galician statement, okay? We actually change the statement, but we actually don't change the operator. In the final difference, we simply, you can think about it as you're directly solving the strong form, okay? However, because you know that the operator, instead of actually trying to using a width statement, you approximate the operator with another operator, okay? Do you understand what I mean? So instead of saying that I completely I calculated the gradient exactly for a space. I actually approximate it as some function of x n plus one, i plus one minus h i divided by delta, delta x, d uh, x blah, blah, blah. Okay, you understand what I mean? So they are actually um, uh, they very different in the sense that one is approximate the operator, and other one is actually using the width statement. Now, before we go further, I want to talk about the property. What are the property you need is that M itself is actually symmetric. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, it makes sense if you use a standard Galician. If you're not using standard Galician, you will find that it's not symmetric. Okay, which sometimes you purposely does. Okay. And also another way people often do is that instead of using the actual M, I will use the row sum or the lump mass of the M to actually simplify the calculations. Uh, we can talk about it later. Another property is that is on the conductivity tensor. In general, the conductivity tensor is also symmetric, but we also uh, providing that the underlying conductivity tensor is actually symmetric. However, we also want one more property for this is that we want this, uh, the, both the conductivity and the capacity matrix to be positive definite. Okay, sorry, not positive definite, positive definite. We want it to be positive definite. Now, what happened, if, let me, that is because if it's not positive definite, something bad would happen. Okay, so what, what kind of bad thing could happen? Uh, let me give an example. Imagine that I'm solving a quasi-static problem. In this case, I have gradient x equal to g ext. That is actually the steady state problem. 
okay so let's say given this equals to let me use the most simple uh positive um can you can you come up with uh can you come up with a singular functions that are interesting maybe one okay so let's do it okay so and one okay what should i put it there to make it positive what what, what should i put it here to make it singular yeah okay very good why is that yeah, yeah, because if I actually look at these two column space and I add minus and times minus one, they become identical. So I actually, this matrix only have rank one, even though it's two by two matrix. Very good. Okay, so uh, let's say this is actually the, I'm not saying this is actually happening. Just imagine this happen. And then I have H1, H2 equals to uh, two and three. Okay, so if you solve this problem, what will happen? Actually, it has no solutions, <laughs> okay? But let's, let's say, uh, let, let me make it less harsh. Let's make it two and make it uh, minor two, okay? Does it have solution now? Does it have solutions? It has, right? What is the solutions? The solutions is H1 minus H2 has to be equal to 2, right? Okay. Okay, so this is the equation. This look like a <laughs> this doesn't look like a solution you expect, right? Okay, but this is actually a solution space, okay? So what does that mean? Is that any x1 and x2, if they are actually separated by two, then it will be a miscible solution. What does that mean? Is that it lacks uniqueness, okay? It has solution, but it doesn't have uniqueness, doesn't it? Right, okay. So instead, if so positive definite, is a way to guarantee the solutions are unique okay some solutions are inherently not unique uh, or actually very sensitive to perturbations um, but here for uh, stable solutions we expect to have uniqueness and you don't want your numerical method to set up incorrectly so that it lost the uniqueness okay so the positive definite is something you can check now, one thing that are very interesting is the following. If you don't have any essential boundary conditions, that could also make the solution losing the uniqueness, okay? You can try this for the artistic problem. Okay, so now go back to the properties. So our first goal is solving this. Okay, so what should I do naturally? is to find a way to describe, uh, discretize the system of equations, right? Okay. Of period time step. Why is that? Because this whole term, if I'm solving it in the Euler, forward Euler, will move to the right-hand side. Okay. Do you see that? Because then this one would be hn plus 1 minus hn divided by delta t. This one would simply be hn. Okay, hn I already know. I just want to solve hn plus 1. So I move the whole thing into the right hand side. So what should I should do is actually to perform the time discretizations. Okay, so in other words, I want to actually write this time derivative 
approximately as some kind of H time derivative uh, of maybe I put a sign there that are actually functions of H at uh, at, uh, at a given time uh, maybe I do this maybe I use this terminology so let's say it's n plus 1 I want it to be a function of h at n plus 1 plus hn plus hn minus 1 plus hn minus 2 blah, 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 blah. okay so this is what actually what we want to do now so for that we actually need to introduce the discretization in time which actually is pretty simple you don't actually need to mention anything because it's 1d it's just equally spacing okay so the way you solve the system of equations is the following so this is the solutions you want to solve okay or well, maybe with the external term I want to write x so that is actually a function of a given time at, uh, at, at 1, 2, 3, and 4, and I'm just matching it one step at a time. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, then I can solve the system of equations. Uh, now, um, to do this, uh, let me talk about a special case. Okay, start with the one-dimensional case. So I have these equations. Okay. Now, uh, let me simplify it, assuming that m, the inverse of m exists, then I will have these equations, right? Okay, so far so good. Okay, I'm I'm I will not actually not investing the m. I'm just provide an analog here, and let's say if g extension is equal to zero, so what I will have is that h dot plus this is actually equal to zero, right? Does that make sense? Now let's call this whole m minus one uh, omega as a. So let a equals to m minus one. Okay, so then I will have x dot plus a x equal to zero. Okay, so far so good. Okay. So now uh, h is actually a vector here and a is a matrix, okay? You understand what, uh, what I'm saying? Okay. Now, but what if I actually uh, perform a singular value decomposition, okay? What if I actually, or I actually do, uh, actually I perform a rotations? Okay, so that I actually, we expect the A in terms of the eigenvalue and the eigenvector. Okay, so what, what would I have? What would I have? I have V, T, um, maybe a diagonal matrix, V, H equal to zero. Okay, so far so good. Okay, and D actually have the diagonal matrix that actually happen to be the eigenvalue. And V and this V is actually the transport of this V. Why is that? Because I actually have a symmetric matrix. So the left eigenvalue vector and the right eigenvector are identical. Okay, now. 
what I actually want to do is to solve the problem analytically for each eigenvalue. So consider this. If I actually consider one eigenmode, then I would actually reducing it into a scalar function. Lambda is actually just the eigenvalues of that n minus uh, omega. Okay. So if I take it, I actually, let me write it as a time relative. I have a lambda h. Okay. And this lead to the following system. The change of the h is actually uh, divided by uh, one, one divided by x uh, times the um, change of x is actually equal to this eigenvalues uh, my negative uh, eigenvalue times uh, for yeah, times the increment of time. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, I'm simply moving this into this side, moving this into this side, and then I get this. Okay. Do you see that? Okay, d d d d time. I'm just d t. I just moving it to here or d tower. H. I'm moving it to here. One divided by divide both side by uh by h, and I get this. Okay. Okay, so this is already done. I uh, we can solve the analytical solutions. Why? Because I can actually integrate it both sides and then if I take the integrations, what would I get? So what is the integrations of a uh, one divided by H? That would be the natural log of H, right? Okay. So what is the integrations of a constant? Uh, that would be simply uh, minus time t. Okay, and then plus constant. Okay, because I actually don't restrict the um, because I don't restrict the range. So I uh, so in principle uh, a constant can move the equation around, and if I take the derivative, that constant vanish. Okay, so I don't know what c is. Okay, so what is the analytical solution for h as a function of t? I simply need to take an uh, exponential operator on the left and exponential operator on the right. Okay, so what I am up half is that h equals to um, a e minor lambda t. Now this a has nothing to do with the previous a I use. Okay, it's actually simply a constant, a coefficient that we don't know. Okay, or oh, actually we know, but it's related to c. Okay. Okay. So have you seen that equation before? Okay. What is interesting about these equations? This is an article equations of uh, for the homogeneous problem um, that we trying to solve that uh, actually uh, okay so it has a very important property and that properly changes with lambda okay you need to know a little bit about the property of the exponential operator okay so if e is times something that uh, uh, let's say x if x is smaller than 1, so what would happen? It introduced, so a is here, so a is these coefficients, okay? First of all, at time equal to 0, uh, h in this a will be simply equal to a, okay? Do you all understand? So e0 is actually just 1. Now, this is actually very important in the sense that if lambda is positive, the whole term is negative because of the minus sign here. So this would indicate decay that eventually will reach zero. Okay, in, okay. so if lambda is actually equal to zero, I'll get a straight line, 
which means that I either gain or lose anything over time. There's no change. Okay, now the last one is very, very important. If lambda is smaller than zero, okay, so what will happen is that it will grow exponentially, okay, and depends on how big, how negative lambda is, uh, you, the solution will grow up, uh, okay. If you buy a stock, you want lambda to be less less than zero in this case um okay so why do we take the trouble to calculating this well, why do we take the trouble to calculating this because does anyone know why do i directly show you x okay x equals to n i approximate x dot equals to hn plus 1 minus hn divided by delta t end of the story i put it into the final element then that's that's the end okay from your implementation point of view this is exactly the case but why do i actually need to take the trouble to do this first so none what do you think I need something to compare with, okay? So I can introduce a lot of different discretization rules. So I'm doing it for time discretization, right? But notice that I never discretizing this in here, right? Okay, so why do I need to establish this? Is that in when I establish a time discretization rules and I can actually establish infinite amount of that by taking different number of, uh, okay. So this is a generic form. I can take as many terms as I want and I assign different coefficients to form different time discretizing rule. However, to judge the merit, what I actually want to do is that I want my time discretizations in, the, in this special case resemble the analytical solutions. Okay, does that make sense? So what I'm actually doing here is to using this as a benchmark and then what I actually want to do is that if I introduce the time discretizations, I want to see what should I do to actually recover these solutions as close as possible, or at least I know how close I am, right? You understand what I mean? Okay, we did not do that before because before we are doing finite element. In time, I'm doing finite difference. So the the different the. The important thing about the finite difference is that I need to know how close my derivative is approximate the actual derivative because quite frankly speaking, I never take any derivative. I'm just saying that the derivative is approximate these two points divided by this difference, but then the true derivative is actually uh, just a preserved distance. My, distance, my discretizations here uh, is actually um, is actually much uh, is actually not exactly the same as the uh, derivative okay you understand what i mean so let me let me using these as illustrations okay let's say i have one d curve okay so what is the true meaning of derivative is that i will actually have this and then preserve an infinite decimal space and then to get this slope that would be the exact derivative do you agree okay what is the finite difference approximation is that I take this pawn, okay, and then I look at this pawn, this pawn, or maybe even more pawn, or just, I can either look at one pawn, two pawn, three pawn, four pawn, whatever pawn that in the neighborhood, and from that, I actually reconstruct a local pattern, and from that, I cal calculate the derivative, okay? In the most simple case, which we call it uh, 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 forward Euler or backward Euler, I'll just take one pawn and then I introduce a linear space and then from that I calculate the slope. Okay, in a more compact case, higher order derivative, I simply take more pawn, approximately with some kind of curve, and then I take a derivative. Okay. Okay, so we have this, and then let me put it away first and I introduce the discretizations, and later on we will be using this. Uh, to compare other property okay so i think that if i understand correctly it will be a good time to take a break before everyone is going to sleep so let's take a 10 minutes break right now we come back at eleven thirty, and i will continue okay 
okay so the mask okay so let let us continue okay so here we want to introduce the time discretizations in a finite defense manner in other words what i want to do is to approximate the time derivative as uh, something else okay taking some sample in the space and then construct a, a, a operator that uh, hopefully we sample the, the behavior of um, uh, the, the behavior of the um, uh, the actual operate time derivative <coughs> okay so for that we would not consider the whole time domain as a continuous operations we we'll consider as a snapshot okay think about it like a movie uh, in a movie uh, you don't actually see that the movie doesn't record the continuous motions okay but it has multiple snapshots that give you the illusion that is continuous right so what we did is actually very similar so we actually would be uh, given only a snapshot of information and then I will go with the matching to from one step to another time step in order to populate the solution in the entire time domain okay does that make sense so let's say that uh, at uh, the Dowsy's velocity at time n Uh, let's say that I want to apostle using V to actually <coughs> apostle as a label or the symbol to represent time derivative at Tn. So Vn represent approximations of uh, of the time derivative at Tn, and then Hn is actually represent the uh, uh, time uh, the potential at Tn. Okay. So if borrowing that terminology, then V n plus one, which is actually the next time. So this is actually time. And then I have an n step and I have n plus one steps. And then I will have V n H n and then V n plus one H n plus one. I know that they would maintain some uh, uh, relationship uh, between each other. And then we make that assumptions that I can somehow using the labor and the current value to make predictions on the VN. Okay, so far so good. I'm just discretizing this whole thing. Now, because the equation holds true for any given time, so I can actually sample it at a, at a particular time, at time Tn and Tn plus one. Okay, does that make sense? Again, the matrix governing equation is m uh, x dot plus omega h equals to g e x t. This actually works for any time, okay? Now, I will take two incidents. At Tn, I will have m v n plus omega h n equals to g e x t n. That n is actually just a sampling of the external term g at n time. And then I will have n plus 1 time, which is actually giving me m v n plus 1 plus omega h n plus 1 equal to g e x t n plus 1. Okay, so far so good. Okay, so why do I sampling this is that I want to using these two as the template to create a possimator. Okay, now Dr. said I only use Tn plus 1 and Tn. I did not use uh, Vn minus 1, Vn minus 2, Vn minus 3. There are algorithm that using multiple time step. Okay, and we will talk about that before. But in the simpler case, there are actually uh, you can involve your the approximations of v, uh, the time derivative with just one previous time step. Okay, so if we do that, then we have a very specific.
why is that matrix become your only stiffness matrix if you pick uh, rules that are called generalized trapezoidal rules we all know what is a trapezoidal okay it's actually like a square or rectangular except that the angle doesn't need to be 90 degree okay do i describe it correctly actually not quite okay <laughs> <laughs> there are also one more <laughs> sorry sorry for doing that okay so so my thought to have that <laughs> that question is rectangular is square or rectangular which is <laughs> i think depends on who you ask okay so uh a square look like this okay uh a trapezoidal rules it's actually pretty close to this except that this angle and this angle has to be equal to each other but they no longer need to be all 90 degree okay so you just have two pair does that make sense okay why do we, i actually talk about this is actually because in this case imagine that i have 1d pattern okay and that i have this curve okay x and now i want to compute the integration of this okay so what i could do is that i can take many many sampling points okay and then from that sampling point i link a straight line i get the approximate shape and then if i do that what do i get there's actually a lot of trapezoidal shape right okay one trapezoidal shape two three four five six seven eight nine okay you just i just just get a lot of pieces here and there and then uh, eventually i can actually approximate the integrations so um the generalized trapezoidal rule actually uh, approximate the h n plus one as h n plus delta t v n plus beta okay i will explain what is beta later and then i will have v n plus beta they're all vector so equals to 1 minus beta vn plus beta vn plus 1 okay so that beta as you can see can be anywhere from 0 and 1 okay it cannot be bigger than 1 and it cannot go negative okay because otherwise you are not taking an average of anything okay so what is this do what is that beta do in these equations i'm doing a weighted average okay of these two that's of these two times i'm saying that okay i don't know what is the velocity so giving a curve in 1d okay i'm actually this curve can change over time okay but at any point of time okay i'm approximating that either i would actually using this as the, as the as the current values okay and i compute uh, i would either using this to do the integrations or i would use this as the integration or i use some kind of average to do the integrations okay so there are three specific cases. one is that uh, that i actually uh study a lot uh, not just in pro mechanics field maybe even in uh, molecular dynamics or other field that require first order time discretizations one is beta equal to zero so beta of equal to zero gives us a very interesting form in the sense that hn plus one is just equal to hn plus delta t vn okay and we simply assuming that v n plus zero, okay, which is actually just v n. Does that make sense? Okay, so basically, oh, I keep the beta. Okay, so what is so interesting thing? What is so interesting is that I can get a new potential without knowing the derivative in that point okay you understand that okay 
So what it implies is that I don't actually need to even assemble the capacity matrix if I want to solve it the, the, the governing equation this way. Okay, why is that? Active stiffness matrix component. Okay, so that looks really nice uh, un until it isn't. <laughs> okay. Like anything in life, it always looks good until it doesn't. So, okay, so we have a quick Nicholson when you take the middle. Okay, taking the middle is not a bad choice. Okay, so you basically are saying that, okay, I'm assuming that, so I have two slopes. Okay, this, I have the pattern. Okay, I don't take this slope. I don't, I'm approximating that in between of this, I get the average of these two slopes and I take this as the slope that I want to perform the integrations. Okay, so you can't take the average. Okay, so when would it be a good choice? Of course, if you, if the, in between the two, the actual, the actual middle is actually <laughs> exactly like this because you are possible with this equation right by the way what happened if you have uh, if your x pattern in time is completely random or actually uh, where we have a loss of jump what would happen none of that would work okay you see what i mean you you actually by solving that you're assuming that there's some kind of smoothness in a lot of physical process have a smoothness, okay? Without the smoothness, any discretization would fail, okay? And then I have a beta equals to 1, which is actually uh, have a good property. This is actually called the various difference. Okay, now uh, this can this fee method the forward Euler okay so this is called backward difference but you can also call it backward Euler I think that people also understand what you're talking about and Craig Nicholson the first method we will call it explicit method and this second two category we will call it implicit method In the explicit method, you actually don't have your effective stiffness matrix in your matrix system doesn't contain the gradient term. You simply consider the uh, the first capacity term and hence uh, it's explicit. And you did not integrate it with the change of the way that I actually put it into the left hand side. So you can, you can essentially guess what is the next step of the potential using the previous step information. So and hence it's explicit. Okay. If you're solving it in an implicit way, uh, and then let me work out this as an example. Okay, so what happened if I actually substitute in this uh, Gaffelin equation is that in the Bergwerk Euler, Hn plus one would be equal to delta t v n plus one oh, sorry i think i'm missing a term here let me write it again h n plus one would be actually equal to um h n which is actually using the previous time step as the first guess plus the correction term delta h v n plus one okay now this is v n plus one okay so in order to know h uh, n plus 1, the potential is n plus 1. I need to also know what is uh, v uh, at n, n plus 1. I need to know the rate of change. And this actually, uh, the n plus beta is actually equal to v n. So I need to have a system of equation that also update the v n plus 1 in order to find the h. So they are actually coupled together. Okay? Do you see the difference? In the explicit scheme, I don't actually need to know Vn plus 1. I can solve Hn plus 1 first, and from that I back calculate what is Vn plus 1. Here I need to solve them concurrently, okay, in a system of equations. So that makes the, um, the conduction term has to be there in order to solve the problem, and hence this is implicit. 
you have a system of equation that give you the solutions, but you can you have to solve it in a matrix system. Okay, another important point is that sometimes the explicit system can be solved in a matrix free manner. Okay, do you know what is a matrix free manner? Okay, so remember that I have that M X dot plus this plus G external. Okay, now if I'm moving this into the left hand side, I only have M X dot equals to G E X T minus the this term, right? Okay, you see what I mean? Now, what if M is actually a diagonal matrix? Okay, if it's a diagonal matrix, I don't have to solve the system of equations together. I can solve it one by one, right? Okay, if I can solve it one by one, I don't even need to assemble the matrix. In fact, I will never assemble a matrix. I just solving it. I just generate equation one by one until I get enough equations for the unknown, and then I'm done. Okay, so I can actually just solve a with loop without actually solving ax equals to b all together. Okay, this is the advantage of explicit method. Here, I really cannot take out this task. Okay, the couple. Okay, I cannot do it. I cannot moving it to the right hand side and say the only unknown is x dot. Let's solving it. Okay, it's just not going to happen. Okay, so on the paper, that would sounds like that the explicit is a good idea, but I can tell you the diffusion problem is almost never solved in a explicit manner. Okay. Uh, and why is that? Do you know? Okay. We can talk about that later, but I can tell you it's really have to make it stable. Okay, so the Laplacian term or the width form that coming from the Laplacian term actually has some good property that you actually need in order to get a good solutions. Okay, so Okay, so to solve something without care about the quality is not that difficult, but if you want to solve something good, then you need to pay attention to the detail to find the right formula. Okay, so I would actually, let me go through how to get the AX equal to B, which is our goal. Okay, so the question is that how to come from these equations into this equation, ax equal to b. Okay, why we, do we need the ax equal to b? Okay, I want to say the following. The reason we want to assemble a linear system of equation ax equal to b is not to calculate the inverse of a. It's not, it's not necessarily a good idea. I can get the solutions, okay, by saying a minus 1 ax equals to a minus 1 b, isn't it? Okay, but in general, you never, almost never did that in practice. Why is that? because uh, calculating the a minus one is very expensive, okay? You're typically solving it, okay? So without moving even further, uh, let me actually uh, uh, write down the, let me apply the Gaffney equations, uh, uh, the trapezoidal rules into the system of equations. So what you will have is this Again, the beta is one parameter that gives you the weight average between the two time steps. Okay, so I just add the delta t there just for um, just for um, just for convenience. So it actually applies to every term here. Okay. I just don't want to divide it by delta t, okay? 
in general, there's no specific reason for adding the delta t, but uh, this would be a safeguard in your calculations because sometimes you initialize your delta t as zero. In particular, if you use the old fortune goal or whatever, or you see plus plus, that would be a default value which is zero. And if you have something divided by zero, you get an NAN and then it will be hard to debug. So the way to do it is that you just times the whole thing by delta t. Now, uh, what you would get eventually work out some algebra is actually m plus beta delta t times the conductivity the, the matrix equals to h n plus one equals to delta t g e x t n plus beta which is just a weight average of the external term plus m minor one minor beta delta t uh, times the capital uh, omega times h n okay so this term this additional term is actually the new term that coming from the previous time step moving into the from the left hand side to the right hand side do you see that okay because vn is actually now the weight average of uh, let's say our for rule is actually n plus one minus hn divided by delta t so if i times the whole thing by delta t i get this it's like this equal to hn plus one minus hn right okay and now i'm simply moving the previous term onto the other hand onto the right hand side why do i moving this hn turn onto the right hand side is because it's already known okay so in the time integration time matching algorithm you know one step and then you're matching to the next step okay so everything you know you put it into the into the right hand side and everything that you still have an unknown parameter you put it into the left hand side so eventually you get a x equal to b okay b cannot be a function of x itself okay with this then we can uh, I can confidently tell you which part is the A. This is actually the A we have in the classical system. This would be the X we have, and then this whole thing would be B. Okay, does that make sense? So now this would give us a very simple system A X equals to B. Okay, so that would be the eventual matrix form, all the finite element uh, solution eventually, sorry, all the implicit finite element solution eventually come down to AX equal to B, no matter where it comes from, what kind of governing equations. If you're solving it implicitly, eventually you have to solve uh, AX equal to B. Okay? So, do you need a Newton Raphson solver to solve this? No, okay, you don't need it. What happened? You put a Newton Raphson solver to solve it. If you get something, okay, you can solve it. <laughs> okay, it will be redundant, but you can. Okay, so what would happen if you use the Newton Raphson solver? How many iterations do you need? You need exactly one, okay, no matter where you start, okay, because it's linear. Okay, so we can talk about the solver setup later, but for now, if your system is not that much, you can even find the inverse of A, it will be fine. Okay, you only don't want to do it if your A, if your degree of freedom is in the order of million, billion, or trillion, then you actually need to find a specific way to solving the problem, maybe find a preconditioner, maybe using a multi-grid method, which we can actually also touch bay a little bit. Okay. So I want to point out some property here. Um, if I actually set the beta equals to one, I will get back the backward Euler or backward difference and we are divide this whole thing by delta t. I, what I would get is that m divided by delta t plus the conductivity tensor equals to h n plus one equal, and that equals to the external uh, 
term at n plus 1 plus the m plus hn divided by delta t. Okay, so now what I actually want to say is that for a system that is stable, which means that both the m, the capacity matrix, and omega, the conductivity matrix, are actually positive definite as delta t going to infinite. Okay, let's say I actually take a time integral that are actually uh, one trillion year. Okay, okay, so what will happen? If I wait long enough, okay, I will actually get back the steady state solutions. I can take out this term, I can take out this term, they no longer do anything to it, uh, and then I will have these equations. Okay, so the time dimension is taking out. Okay, there's no longer any dimension in time, and then that would be called again the steady state solutions okay what is important to remember is that even if the delta t is not equal to zero if i actually integrate it long enough eventually i should be able to reach the steady state solution for the richardson equations okay you see what I mean? So when you implement your code, and then you find that, uh, okay, it keep evolving infinitely, that means something is wrong. <laughs> okay, at some point, okay, so there's uh, exceptions. If your, if your uh, p square natural boundary conditions or essential conditions is also changing with time infinitely, then you should see the system changing continuously, uh, infinitely. But if your time solution, if your p square boundary condition actually also reach the steady state doesn't change in time anymore, eventually the whole system should not move. Okay, in nature you see that, so that's why water will have a hydrostatic state that the water no longer move once it's in equilibrium or moving constant velocity without changing anything. If you can keep the head constant. Okay, so far so good. Okay, so how many of this is, how many of you already learned all of this? It's just a review. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Okay, I will go faster. Okay, so um, I can talk about the computer, but I can also, I also want to talk about the convergence. So is that okay I talk about the convergence just to complete this and I move on to, to, to the computer? Is that okay? So, okay. So, we talk about all this, but then here, what I want to talk about is that um, I want to talk about the property, in particular, the important questions of convergence. So, uh, I have these equations. Equation one that I actually look like this. that I did not discretize in time. Okay. And then I have a discretized solutions that I actually did not look at the time in a continuous manner, but I just observing it. Okay. Uh, and then I just sample it in as approximations. And then I have another system of equation that I did not even exactly obtain the time derivative properly but I use the approximate operator time derivative using the generalized trapezoidal rule to assemble the system. Okay, so this gives us two equations, two set of equations uh, with two different, slightly different property, right? Okay, of course our goal is to make it identical, but in uh but it's it is not. Okay, so I want to ask some questions for you to think about it. So there are some observations that are important. Okay. So
So let's consider the exact solutions. Okay. So if you substitute the exact solutions, if I substitute the exact solutions onto system one, so what would happen into these governing equations? It will satisfy it completely, right? Okay, but if you substitute in the second uh, in the second equation, will they satisfy it? So this will satisfy the first equation, but not two. Okay. Now, on the other hand, so that means the exact solutions is actually not the not necessary the the same solutions as the not always okay in special case they might but okay on the other hand if you have hn if you have discretized solutions etc blah, blah, blah. so this satisfy equation one it won't okay you just approximating it so you satisfy one Okay, so our final element only gives us access to the approximate solutions, right? Okay, so how do we know that, how do I actually know that my finite element solution is somehow correct? Okay, what is the idea of correctness? If, if you, I know it's not identical, okay? Imagine that you're taking an exam, 100 is the full score, I know that I will never get 100. Okay, so so that mean that uh, does that mean you fail the test? <laughs> it probably doesn't, right? You can still do a very good score, but what do you want is to get as close to one hundred perfect score as possible. Okay. So now imagine that you take a course, okay, and then you know that I take more effort, I can increase the grade. Okay, would you rather take that course or you take another course that? If you put more effort, your grade can go up or go down. <laughs> it depends on how much excitement you want. <laughs> I'm very conservative. I will take the course that if I take more effort, I can improve my grade. Okay? So, in that analog, what we actually want is some kind of convergency. Which means that conversion doesn't mean that you can actually obtain the exact solutions. But in general, what it means is that I can use some strategy, mainly by refinement of my mesh, both in space and time, to get as close to the solution as possible. And it has to be guaranteed that if I increase my mesh, or I actually refine my time, make the time step a little bit smaller, I would, I would improve the solutions. Okay? In real life, sometimes... <laughs> You, you get you, sometimes you get a good solution in a coarse mesh and you refine it, you get a fine mesh that are further away from the analytical solutions. So if this happens, what it means is that you have a wrong implementations. Okay? It doesn't mean that I should use the coarse solution to obtain the solutions. Okay. Okay, so what is the I guess the most important question is that what is the necessary ingredient for you to get the convergent solutions? It requires two things. A is the stability. The solutions has to be stable, which means that it does not grow up, suddenly become infinite, exploding, or actually amplify indefinitely. Okay? The solutions has to have some decaying property or at least um, doesn't grow uh, indefinitely. And the other thing is the consistency. So these two are necessary ingredients for the conversion, which means that I almost always get a solution that are closer to the actual uh, non discrete time, continuous time solutions if I actually make delta T as small as possible. Okay?
So uh, if you look, if you read Professor Tom Hughes' book, you can find the following statements. Stability <sighs> plus consistency is actually implying convergence. Okay? Like everything in life, there are exceptions in the rules, but not in this statement, okay? So, um, an uh, example is like PIN, okay? If you saw physics in from neural network, you, you actually have to navigate a non-convex space that doesn't necessarily have the stability in a parametric space. Uh, and you cannot guarantee the consistency either because uh, you actually don't know if you will find the time you would actually get the solution better. There's a possibility of getting it better, but it doesn't guarantee it to be better. Okay, so um, what I actually want to do is to check both the consistency and the stability and then I will finish this course and I will delay the computer section to the next one if this is actually okay. And I think I have enough time to achieve just that. So now consider this case. I will use the ingredient we talked about it before. I will consider your homogeneous equations, which means that I will take out the external term. Okay, so this is actually called um, homogeneous uh, PDE. And they are used for, and uh, often used to analyze the time integrator. Okay, now I will do something different, but very close to what I did before. I will assume that the actual analytical solution is actually this H plus the mode plus E minus lambda T. Okay. So what is this? This is actually some kind of uh, shape or pattern that I would have to actually form the equations and that it somehow uh, change with time uh, with the exponential operator. I will assume that this would be my analytical solutions. Okay? So far so good? Now, if this is the case, my I have an exact form of the time derivative, right? Okay, so I'll take the time derivative of h and what I will get is minor lambda uh, times this mole shake times the e minus t. Okay, so far so good. I just merely take the derivative of the exponential term. So what I would have is that I have this term. Okay, how do I get, get this term? I substitute it back into these equations. Okay, you see that? Okay, this one I don't need substitute, this is just h. Okay. Well, actually I do, I, I put, let me put it. I put this term into here, and then I put this this whole thing into here, and then I will, I together I will I write these equations. Okay. So why do I care about these equations? Let's separate these two into two different terms. Okay. So uh, what are the behavior I want to get in here? What, what do I want to get from this first term? Or more accurately, what, what is the thing that I don't want to have from this in this term? I don't want this term to have an uh, eigenvalue of 0, right? Okay, if it has eigenvalue of 0, 0 plus anything is equal to 0 anyway, right? 
okay so i don't want to do that so in order to guarantee the solubility i need the non-trivial solutions from which means that i need the non-zero solutions where i can actually find the where i can calculate it by computing the characteristics polynomial uh, of this which give you which give me a bunch of uh, uh, which give me a number of uh, uh, lambda that are actually with the last one being the number of equations okay in general I want this to be actually be a positive real number okay not even including zero okay for the same reason i don't want the system of equation become singular okay so if i actually do this okay so i can actually lump the equations in the following form i can try to solve the eigen value solutions by actually finding this equal to zero this is actually the eigenvector corresponding to this matrix okay more accurate n minus one omega this is actually called a generalized eigenvalue problem okay do you know why it's called generalized eigenvalue instead of eigenvalues the eigenvalue problem is that m equals to identity okay that's the eigenvalue problem the generalized eigenvalue have the m but m that, but m must be the inverse of m must exist okay uh, so one thing that could be interesting is that the I can normalize the eigenvector such that this term has actually become a conical delta. Okay, why do I say that? Okay, let me let me give an example then you can understand. Let's say one zero let's say I solve an eigenvalue problem. Okay, one minus lambda, one minus lambda is zero zero. Okay, so and then zero zero. Okay, what is the eigenvector? Oh, sorry, let me give her values. If lambda equals to zero, oh, actually, maybe lambda equals to two. Okay, so what will be the eigenvector? Can you give me an eigenvector? What will be the eigenvector? I have minus one minus one, so it's pretty confusing. <coughs> that would be just uh, zero zero right. That would be just the new vector. So let me give another example. Maybe that would be easier. Two. Okay. So what will be the eigenvector? Uh, and lambda equals to one. Okay. Let's say. What will be the eigenvector? Just one zero, right? Isn't it? Oh, sorry, just zero one, right? Or oh, one zero. Okay, let me write it out. So if lambda equals to one, then I will have zero 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 one, which is actually equal to zero zero. So what will be the eigenvector?
I can have uh, one seal here, does it give me zero zero? I can have two, I can have five, I can have one thousand, I can have one trillion, all of them give me zero, right? Okay, so the eigenvector, the, the moral of that story is that eigenvector is not united. Okay, it could be anything that are orthogonal to the uh to to the to the space that uh you want to actually uh, the subspace you want to be orthogonal to okay however normalized meaning that i want to have some property in particular i want the egg the norm of this vector egg and vector uh equal to some values usually equal to one then i call it normalized okay the reason we can normalize the eigenvector is that eigenvector is not unique. It can be scaled in any possible way. Okay, you understand what I'm saying? Like a vector, in general, you would actually represent a vector with an orthogonal normal process, uh, basis, which means that each basis has the norm of exact one just for convenience. But in reality, you can represent a vector with a basis that have the that have the norm of two or five or one thousand. Okay, it doesn't matter. It just need to be independent. Okay, so I just explain the normalizing term a little bit. Okay, so uh, I actually for that I need to scale in my eigenvector properly. But if I can do that, I can I can actually achieve achieve something that uh, make my life easier down the road, which is actually of of a normality. Okay, the first term of orthogonal meaning that they are actually the eigenvector are all orthogonal to each other, meaning that the dot product is always equal to zero, which means that if you project one to the other, you get nothing. Okay, so let me give it so. So this is two vector. If I project it into project this vector into this vector, I get something. I get the x component. This is not orthogonal. Okay. This is orthogonal if the dot product is equal to zero, okay. Normalized meaning that I chop it so that the length of m is actually equal to each other. Okay, so. Okay, so with that, then what we would have is that uh, these governing equations I can take it out. Okay, so maybe I should use another, maybe I call it K, okay, I just don't want to repeat this. Okay, so th those are three index. Okay, so if I actually, so what you actually observe is actually the, the following. So this, what we have is this term and then this term. Now I get the clinical data simply because I'm normalizing it. So what would, what it would happen, what it imply is that if I actually, uh, if I actually have a projections of this uh, first term with the, in the eigenvector mode, I will get back the eigenvalues if uh, m is actually equal to l and I will get zero otherwise. Okay, can you see that? This is simply coming from the second term, the clinical delta. If m equals to n, I get one. If m is not equal to one, I get zero and hence, hence this. Okay, so why do I actually want to do this? Is because I want to perform something called a uh, Galakian projections or modal decompositions in the linear term. Okay, so this is modal decompositions. I have an edge in terms of inf yeah, it's a function of time. And then what I actually have is a n e q 
times i equals to 1 and then have the hi as a function of t times the eigenvector okay so this hi as a function of t is actually the Fourier coefficients and this is actually the eigenvector that are obtained from the generalized eigenvalue problem okay so far so good okay so this one give you a value that change over time and this one give you the this give you the mode shape okay so for example this one if i have a 1t problem and i solve an eigenvector i may have some term that look like this and another term that look like this and some term that look like this okay etc etc so this give you the mode and then uh, for the different mode, I will have a corresponding h1, t, x2, t, and x3, t. And I add these together, and then I will get some kind of thing that maybe look like this. Okay, you see what I mean? Okay, this is actually the modal decompositions in the what it implies, modal decompositions, M-O-D-A-L. Okay, so what the, what the imply is that I decompose it with different mode and then I combine it together linearly, modal decompositions. Okay, and the reason I can do that is because the boundary value problem I solve is linear, meaning that the capacity matrix and the conductivity matrix doesn't change in time. Okay, so the problem is still linear. Mm -hmm. So what I would have is that I would have that x term plus t equals to n e q okay so if we take a time derivative it will be just be like this right okay just the coefficient taking a time derivative and what i would have is that if i substitute this an article form back so what i would have is that i will have this i will have this first term plus this second term zero okay the important thing is that the important trick is here uh, those are eigenvector okay so eigenvector that are actually normalized so when they're normalized they have very one nice property is that this would be simply uh, lead to the uh, this would be simply lead to the identity matrix and this would this two term would actually equals to this if i if you are in the diagonal term and it will be the off the diagonal term are all zero so this actually decouples the solution so eventually i have i j plus lambda j x j which is actually the following coefficients equal to zero and there is no sum here this is not an index okay just uh, for different mode j refers to the mode okay so if you take a structural dynamics you do an eigenvalue decomposition you have mode 1 mode 2 mode 3 mode 4 and then you linear combine that mode to get a solution this is exactly the same thing okay so lambda j is actually a positive definite number and this is actually uh, so what you have is that inside of a system of equations in the spectral uh, domain all the solutions are decoupled and then i just need
need to solve a sequence of solutions that are actually one by one and then I would actually obtain the solutions. Okay, does that make sense? So why do we want to do that? So what are the applications of the motor decompositions? First of all, if your system is actually linear, you can definitely solve it simply from motor decompositions. After the motor decomposition is actually complete, you actually can solve the equation one spectral at a time and then combine them together to form the entire solution. Does that make sense? That's one possibility. Another one, which is actually what we want to do right now uh, before the end of this lecture, is to analyzing the Euler, okay? And then to establish the convergence of the time integrations. Okay, so what we actually want to do is that now I can completely decomposing the, my solution into multiple uh, solutions that look like that, but lambda is actually corresponding to a mole. Okay, so in this sense, x dot is equal to minus lambda h. Okay, now I actually want to see how I want to actually check one thing. The first thing I want to check is the stability. Okay, what I actually want to check is that will my solutions, if I integrate this, uh, with my uh, time integrator, one million of time, eventually we did actually blow up or actually grow in an artificial manner, even though the physics tells us it should reach the steady state. Okay, so let's do that. And then uh, let's put the time discretization here. So uh, I have the x dot equals to minus delta x. Now I apply the time discretization. The first term will give us uh, beta n plus 1 plus be lambda h n plus 1 equal to 0 and then I will have h n plus 1 equal to h n plus delta t of v n plus beta and I also have 1 minus beta v n plus lambda v n equal to 0 Plus, which is actually, and I have this waveform. Okay, so far so good. Now here, actually what I want to do is to write this whole thing. Uh, I want to know what is the relationships of uh, n plus 1 as a function of uh, hn. Okay, why do I want to do that? I want to actually know in between the two time steps whether the solution get amplified or actually get declined by my discretization, by the cho artificial choice I use to do the final differences. Okay. Uh, if you actually uh, substitute the governing equations here, into the uh, e e uh, these two equations, what I we will have is that we have n plus sorry v n plus b plus lambda b n plus one plus n minus beta h n would be equal to zero. Okay, so this one say that um, uh, this one would be well, I can substitute this one here and eventually what I would have is that I will have h n plus 1 minus h n plus lambda delta t beta h n plus 1 plus lambda delta t 1 minus beta h n equal to zero okay i just have these two equations minus each other now i would put the x n plus one on the left hand side and then all the term with h n which means i keep these two terms 
on the left hand side and these two terms in the right hand side if I write this I will get x n plus 1 equals to 1 minus lambda delta t 1 minus beta divided by 1 plus lambda delta t beta h n okay so this term has a specific name is actually called the amplifications factor okay if you're actually solving these homogeneous equations if you put this thing in you will simply have h n plus one equals to if we call it a then there will be a h n okay this is very interesting so how do i get a, uh, how do i get uh how do i get uh h n plus two h n plus two would be a h n plus one would be a a h n right okay how do i get h n plus three that would be a h n plus two which is actually a a h n plus one which is actually a a a h n okay how do i get h n plus four okay i don't want to torture my hand i keep writing more term but you get the idea so what do you want for the a in order for the stability what do you actually want if you want your solutions to remain finite in the providing that your your um your physical underlying physical problem is stable is that the, the absolute value of a has to be smaller than one does that make sense okay so what what happened if the absolute value of a is smaller than one yeah exactly it gives you no capacity for x to become infinite right you understand what i'm saying okay so this in pi a could be smaller than one or actually larger than minus one but not on the other way so what you would have from the stability is that you will have this term okay so how many inequality do we have here by the way it may look very very boring but in the old day you can i mean from what i talk about 20 minutes before to now you already published two paper <laughs> so i mean okay so i already reviewed two paper for you so it's just uh, okay but um but that being said, I, I'm not arguing in the be before the time is easier. You can argue f equals to m is not very trivial. But imagine that you're Newton, you're living in the 16th century to try to find it or whatever. So, okay, so there are two equations here, equation two and equation one. Okay, I simply, the reason I separate the two equations is that I want to find out what beta is a good value for us to guarantee the stability. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's consider equation one. Okay, the first part of the equations, I will simply times everything uh, in the, with one plus uh, lambda delta t beta, and what I will have is minus one minus lambda delta t beta is actually greater than the one minus lambda delta t beta plus lambda beta delta t beta okay i do some simplifications then i would have lambda delta t one minus two beta is greater than two okay so i just moving this into this side then moving the other part into the other side okay so in order to satisfy inequality number one this part what i would have is that um, i have beta greater or equal to um, 
one possibility is that beta is always greater than one half, right? Can you see that? Okay. Uh, another one is that, uh, let's consider a case. This is always equal to smaller than delta, uh, smaller than uh, one half. So in this case, I can actually still guarantee this whole term is greater than two, but I have to consider the fact that my delta t is now limit, right? Why is it limit? It has to be smaller than two divided by two, one plus two beta, okay? So this one is, so when beta is greater than one half, this whole term become negative. So a negative number, provided number and delta t are positive, would always be, a negative number would always be smaller than two, right? Do you agree? Okay, so no, no problem, unconditional. So this is actually why it's called unconditionally stable. Okay, so what are the unconditionally stable methods in all of the three? The backward Euler and the Craig Nicholson are unconditionally stable. Okay, the forward Euler, on the other hand, are not necessarily unstable, but is conditionally stable. Which means that you need to settle the right parameter for it to not boring up. And that's an actually interesting exercise, very easy to program. If you program it like that, try to program something that are uh, actually unstable. You can see that very quickly. You use the Excel file, it will blow up much uh, really fast. In particular, if you use Excel file, do you know why? Because it actually doesn't take enough uh, significant digits, so it will blow up even faster. <laughs> okay, you, you see what I mean? Because you take the significant, uh, you, would, you would chop off after some significant value. So one of the important thing in the earthquake, actually, uh, it's my personal experience is that a lot of time the accelerogram are actually integrated with Excel. And then if you do that, it, you guarantee to have a terrible results because the accelerogram, if you integrate it, uh, if you offset with some offset, you can, let's say my accelerations look like this. Okay. Now I have some instrument earlier and then the whole thing shift a little bit. Okay. The pattern is still there. So what would happen to my or velocity or the, the or the speed okay this thing <laughs> instead of the real one that i don't know how it look like maybe something like this okay i just make up some pattern doesn't correspond to that i would actually have this whole thing become this okay with two because i have a linear offset right and then my displacement field which supposed to actually maybe also look like a pattern that move left and right would instead have a quadratic pattern in the background and i add this Okay, now if you actually don't have a significant digit and it's conditionally stable, it will be even worse. Okay, you can try that. Anyway, so uh, let me go through the second part, th this criteria. This criteria, if you work out the algebra, that would be delta lambda t must be smaller than zero. So it's actually not a problem because lambda is positive, delta is negative, uh, is delta t is also positive, two things is positive, my part times the minus sign is always negative, negative is always uh, smaller than zero, so, it's, uh, so the second inequality is not a problem, okay? Now let me ask you another question, what if you want to solve the problem backward in time? Is it in, in, in feet? <laughs> do you think it's possible? If you know the solution of the current time and will instead of propagating forward, I want to propagate backward. Okay, everything is possible, but it will be much more difficult, okay? So, so the far problem is easier to solve, why? Because you're actually coming from a uh, uh, sharp gradient with the Laplacian term, over time you're getting smoother and smoother and smoother and smoother until there's no, no inform, un, until you get a straight line, okay? Or some smooth pattern. If you're solving backward in time, your numerics need to be able to get the pattern sharper and sharper and sharper and sharper which is actually really hard to be stable okay so 
if you're interested in doing that, which I sometimes think is an interesting problem, you probably need to think about it carefully, but I won't recommend that doing it in a generic fatter element. Okay, so I just talked about the stability. I do want to talk about the accuracy and the convergence, but I think that we are running out of time, if I remember. So it's N at 1240, right? Okay, so I do actually have... Uh, I do actually prepare some Phoenix uh, exercise, so I would actually communicate with you offline. So next week, please bring the computer. I think we will try to solve some problem. Do you think that um, 